Ovarian cancer, as I mentioned, is an uncommon disease. Fortunately, the drugs that we have for primary therapy are active. We know this because in trials that we've done with patients who have had bulky disease left after surgery, will end up at the end of their chemotherapy with no visible tumor by CAT scan and with a negative exam in CA125. So we know this is a chemosensitive disease. And since most patients now in the United States are getting good surgery as well as good chemotherapy, the 75 or more percent of those patients are actually ending up at the time of completion of their frontline therapy with no, no disease. And it goes into this question again at that, at that point is, you know, what can we do to maintain that? So the issue of maintenance really was born out of that primary situation where you finish your frontline therapy. We know there's a high risk of recurrence, but we don't know what to do about it. And we've done maybe 15, 20 randomized trials in that situation. And we've been able to show in a couple that we can delay progression, but we can't actually make those, we haven't been able to show that we've been able to cure more patients with the induction of maintenance. So at that time, when patients are finished with frontline therapy, many patients will go into what's called observation. And there's some benefit for both of that, for, 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 the, for that kind of uh, clinical plan. One is that patients usually have toxicity from their frontline therapy and they need some time to recover. The second is, is that we really don't know that we can influence outcomes, but, um, but we do want to make sure that we keep close surveillance because there's options for patients if they recur. Now, a lot of, patient, a lot of patients and, 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 and physicians will ask, you know, what's, my, what's the risk of recurrence for advanced ovarian cancer? And it's high. So we know this because in most of our frontline trials, we can measure out what is the time to first progression pretty easily and most patients will progress. In fact, if you look at the tail of those PFS curves from frontline therapy, you see there's only about 20, 25% of patients, depending on what, you, what kinds of patients you start with, are actually disease-free past five years. And those patients are probably at very low risk uh, to recur at that point. So that means that 70, 75% of patients who finish therapy and look good are gonna recur. And even if we operate on those patients at the completion of their frontline treatment and find no disease, half of those patients are gonna recur. So it's really a major health burden once the patients are diagnosed with the disease. And so our close surveillance that happens at the time of maintenance um, time period is looking for the, when those patients are recur so we can enact more therapies. It's, um, it's a stressful time uh, for patients, it really is. And they generally will get the white coat syndrome when they're right around the time to come in for their three month visit, which is what we frequently will do. At this time, we're not able to actually pick or predict which of the patients are going to recur or not recur, but we can have some inference as to how long it will be until they recur. So now that we're out around you know, a year and a half, two years, we start to think about what the options will be for a patient who would recur at that time period. When the patients are in the, in the group that are maybe the 25% that recur under a year, those patients have not as much sensitivity as you as, they, as we would have anticipated when they first started their disease. And we call them, those patients, chemo-resistant. Sometimes you hear the term platinum-resistant. And, and the definition of what is a platinum-resistant patient is really not well described. I can tell you that we frequently use the term as six months, but it's completely arbitrary and really represents a continuum. In other words, that the, the, time point, the point in time that a patient recurs actually describes a continuous improvement in their ability to respond to the next line of therapy the longer it, be, it goes on. So short intervals, short likelihood for response, long intervals, long opportunity for, or big opportunity for response. So many people will use the six month characteristics to define platinum sensitive and platinum resistant patients. And some of us will use 12 months because that rep represents a, a a more sensitive population that would be potentially amenable to, to a platinum-based reinduction. And that's really what this is all about. What do you do when the patient recurs? If they're under six months or 12 months, patients will, will frequently be receiving a non-platinum agent. And if they're after 12 months or after six months, they're often retreated with a platinum-based um, doublet. And the reason this is important in this discussion about the PARP inhibitors is that most patients who carry a BRCA mutation are gonna have very long treatment-free intervals. They're gonna be amenable to platinum reinduction. And now that we have the availability of the PARPs, there's this opportunity that now we can treat these patients with a PARP. And as I mentioned before, some of that has been with the concept of maybe we can revisit the maintenance 
question all over again. Like I mentioned before, with primary maintenance, now we're talking about secondary or switch maintenance, which is a concept that was really born out of the fact that if we treat a patient who's considered platinum sensitive and they respond to treatment, maybe the machinery is messed up and maybe we can actually impact those patients again by using a PARP inhibitor.